All right, so this lecture will begin our journey into the cardiovascular system. Um, we will touch first on blood. We'll look at blood and blood typing. Then we'll look at the structure of the heart and basically its electrical properties and its pumping mechanism. And then we'll look at circulation. So we'll look at blood vessels. In a separate lecture, we will get into blood pressure, blood flow, and um, uh, cardiac output, some property, physical properties of the heart. Okay, and this lecture, blood, heart, and circulation will divide up into two. Um, this part will deal with the blood and the structure of the heart, and then we'll get into the functioning of the electrical activity and the physical pumping of the heart for the second part of this lecture. All right, so what's the function our circulatory system all right one of the main is transport basically we have to get those gases we've done our cellular respiration we see we have to get oxygen to our tissue and we got to get carbon dioxide out of the blood out into the atmosphere um, also we pick up our nutrients all the foods we eat we get absorbed into the bloodstream and those nutrients because we need to have those glucose or those proteins or um, fatty acids to use as energy sources and to build things like proteins and then waste we have to get rid of the waste products uh, regulation we can regulate some of our temperature so by dilating or constricting oops dilating this way constricting the blood vessels and then hormonal that's where our hormones were able to transport hormones through the system. Uh, another is protection. We get clotting and our immune system basically resides chiefly in our cardiovascular system or parts of our cardiovascular system along with our lymphatics. So the major components we're going to deal with heart. All right, we need ability to create pressure. We have to be able to create pressure so we can pump blood throughout the system. We have the heart with the blood vessels, and that is how we're able to transport this blood throughout our bodies. So cardiovascular system, we got the four chamber pump, and we'll go into grave detail on how it operates and the different structures of it, All right? But that's where we're gonna create that force to pump the blood and then we have our vessels our vessels are basically the pathways the streets to out towards the organs to supply the blood supply those nutrients supply those respiratory gases to our tissues all right uh lymphatics and we're going to deal with lymphatics a bit more when we get to the immune system but we got lymphatic vessels and those parts that also make up part of the circulatory system, but also where they're going to be a major part in our respiratory system, or sorry, our immune system. So first, let's look at where do these nutrients, what is our medium in which we transport things through the cardiovascular system, and that's going to be our blood. So if you took our blood out, and centrifuge it down it would look like this and for an average adult five liters is about the amount of blood they have um, larger individuals may have up to six liters and our arterial blood our arterial blood is going to be red and that's going to be owed due to the hemoglobin being oxygenated oxygenated hemoglobin gives a red color Whereas venous blood okay, is a darker red because it has lost, not lost, but a lot more of the hemoglobin is what we call deoxygenated, okay, lacking oxygen, where it comes with a darker red color, we get a brighter red with the oxygenated blood. Okay, but as I was saying, if we took your blood out and we centrifuge it down, we spun it where the heavy stuff goes to the bottom, the lighter stuff to the top, we'll see that about 45% are called 
made up of the formed elements. And the formed elements are going to include actually two layers to this. We're going to have red blood cells, which is the big bulk of the formed elements, and then this little white buffy coat right here where our white blood cells and platelets will reside. Okay, and those is only about 1% of the actual blood. And then the top layer, the bulk of the blood is the blood plasma, about 55% volume wise. And that's going to include the watery portion, the aqueous portion of the blood, um, along with dissolved proteins, um, those ions that are in there, the respiratory gases, those would all be found in the blood plasma. Okay, so your red blood cells forming your hematocrit down here, the buffy coat, those are the cells or formed elements because not all are as are cells. They are heavier, so they are brought down here, and then the lighter stuff like those ions and those smaller molecules dissolved in the aqueous portion would be found up here in the blood plasma. So just a little more link posit. As we said, the buffy white coat, 1%. Those are the leukocytes, the white blood cells and the platelets. The 44% of that 45% is those red blood cells. And then the plasma takes up about 55%. All right, and what is in that plasma? You can see all these smaller items, not cellular levels or formed elements as we call them, but these smaller proteins, electrolytes, gases, all the small elements are what we would find in this aqueous portion of the blood. Just more down we're going to be going into these we'll be talking more about red blood cells when we get to the respiratory portion of this class and for immunity we will talk about our white blood cells okay but that is what you're finding in the buffy coat and this is what we're finding in that what we call the hematocrit big red layer there So looking a little closer into these components or constituents of blood, um, one of these formed elements, again, we call them formed elements because they are similar cellular, but they're not typically always cells. In the case with the red blood cells, um, they are cells, but they lack organelles, they lack nuclei. So basically they are these big, almost sacs of hemoglobin. But our erythrocytes or red blood cells, Okay, again, they lack the nuclei, lack organelles, and what do they have? They have all this hemoglobin, which is going to carry the oxygen. And you can see they are small and they're biconcave, and why are they set up this way is this biconcaveness allows us to increase surface area and allow for the distance of traveling. So for um, the function of diffusion, these are set up this way so we can diffuse those gases in and out rather quickly. All right, and what makes up these erythrocytes? They have this hemoglobin, this four globin molecule, four protein molecule. See the four subunits here. And each of these subunits are gonna have this little heme group with an iron iron in the center and this is what's going to bind the oxygen all right and this is when oxygen is bound we get that bright red color which is the oxygenated blood is bright red and we have roughly about 280 million molecules of hemoglobin in each red blood cells and we have millions of red blood cells so you can imagine how much oxygen carrying capacity we have we can carry quite a bit of oxygen via our hemoglobin 
right? The other, that little buffy coat forming our formed elements are our leukocytes, all right? And we have, this probably looks familiar from your anatomy days. We have granulocytes with the visible granules. See the little granules in here? And then the agranulocytes with our lymphocytes and our monocytes down here. So besides the leukocytes and that little white buffy coat, uh, we'll also find our platelets or our thrombocytes. Okay, thrombocytes are made, they're basically our cellular fragments. They are basically pieced off from these megokaryocytes, these bigger cells that ooze off these platelets. Okay, they are small structure, but they are involved in that blood clotting. When we're making scabs, those are our platelets that are there to stop the bleeding from taking place. So we will go over these. We'll go in that process of making that platelet plug to make our scab to prevent bleeding out. So our white blood, or sorry, our blood cells are our formed elements of our blood. They have a short lifespan. So we have to continually produce these cells in what we call hematopoiesis. That is a process of forming new red blood cells. And we have to do this in a manner that is, we're not making too many. We're just basically resupplying the ones that we are degrading, the old blood cells that we are degrading. So we don't get an over accumulation and we don't get too few. We have to keep this process regulated. Okay, keep it in a homeostatic manner. Uh, many of you probably have heard of leukemia, leukocytes, leukemia. Leukemia is cancer of the blood, of the white blood cells. There's over accumulation of white blood cells because there are constant division and too many white blood cells are being formed. Okay, but all these cells, they start off at a cell called hemat, oh, sorry, hemocytoblasts. These are the stem cells. And stem cells, they can divide and they can do what we call differentiation. They can go towards making different types of cells. And what happens when we do this is when we differentiate, we go towards a cell line. We differentiate. We can't go backwards. That's kind of what a lot of the researchers are trying to do is go backwards, bringing our cells back to, say, a hematocytoblast. Then we can form all kinds of different cells. But in the body, cells will divide. These stem cells, hematocytoblasts will divide. They can go down different pathways. But once they go down the certain pathway, they can't go in reverse. Okay, And there are two cell lines that are formed from the hematocytoplast. Basically, the myeloid line is forming everything except for the lymphocytes. So all the different white blood cells, the red blood cells, the megakaryocytes that make platelets are from a myeloid line. So hematocytoblast goes towards the myeloid, myeloid line, differentiates towards there. It can only become these cells. When it differentiates to the myeloid line, it can't go back and become lymphocytes. Same with if it goes towards the lymphocyte line, we can't go back to form red blood cells or megakaryocytes or the other white blood cells. Okay. So this is, so your cells are basically formed in pathways. They go to one cell to the next, and then finally get to the mature cell. Um, you might've looked at this for the different white blood cells, the hematopoiesis for the different white blood cells. For our case, we're going to look at erythropoiesis. We're going to look at, the making of mature red blood cells. Um, and this changes uh, in what environment you're at. Okay, What are red blood cells for? They are for carrying oxygen. There are certain environments where oxygen levels are lower. This is where you've heard people or athletes going up to high elevations to train because when they come down the lower elevation, they actually have a better oxygen carrying capacity and 
The reason for this is because they are inducing erythropoiesis when they go to those higher elevations where there is lower amounts of oxygen, your body needs to produce more red blood cells, do more erythropoiesis to be able to help counteract the low oxygen levels they can help counteract so they can keep a sufficient oxygen carrying capacity in the blood so they can fuel those cells right and what are they doing they are basically stimulating the release of erythropoietin from the kidneys this will get released in low oxygen and out of good oxygen detected and the kidneys release this and that will start our process in hematocytoblasts. That gets formed a pro-erythroblast, stimulated by erythropoietin, erythroblast, and now we're headed towards making our red blood cells to our normal blast, our reticulocyte, and if you remember, our red blood cells. They are formed elements because there are no nuclei, no organelles, in the red blood cells they are basically i mean simply put they are big bags of hemoglobin to carry these oxygen you'll see there are also enzymes in there when we get to respiratory but the mature erythrocytes there are no nucleus no organelles in those cells okay So you guys have all probably heard of blood types, and this uh, is in regards to our red blood cells. Our red blood cells give us what our blood types are. And so how this is determined is there are antigens. Okay, antigens are specific molecules on the surface of the cells. Okay. You've probably heard of antigens, antigens in the fact that the coronavirus has antigens. Okay, everything has these surface markers. Our cells have these surface markers called antigens. Of course, we, are immune, we try not to have our immune system go after our own antigens. We want them going after viral antigens, but they do have these surface antigens or these name tags. And this is basically what, what surface molecules we have on our red blood cells are going to give us our blood type. And we have two systems here. We have what's called the ABO system and the RH system or the antigen D system. Okay, ABO system is going to have deal with A antigen, B antigen, or the lack of these antigens, which would be O. Okay. How your blood type is determined is by what antigens are on your red blood cells. Okay, it's determined by what antigens are there. Okay, and it's genetically determined. All right. So if you have an A antigen on your red blood cells, you would have a blood type if you had B antigen only on your red blood cells you would be B blood type and you can have both A and B antigen or you can have neither of them okay so let's look at how this works and this comes in important because we need to match blood types for blood transfusions when we're giving blood to patients we need to match the blood type um, so we don't have a what we call a cross reaction between the blood um, and we'll see why because we're going to deal with antigens and we're going to see there are antibodies that our bodies can produce to go after these red blood cells all right so our a b system again we already said if you have a antigen a little blue Circle here, this would be blood type A. You have the B, your blood type B. If you have both on the surface, your AB, and then the lack of either of them, you have O blood type. All right, 
That is the ABO system. We're going to see, we're going to add the RH in here in a bit. That's positive or negative, but you're either A, B, AB, or O for the ABO system. All right, and the key is, is your immune system, right? Your immune system, we in, introduce, say, coronavirus antigens so we can produce antibodies against the coronavirus antigens so we, our immune systems are trained to attack coronavirus. This is the same as we'll produce antigens against foreign antibodies. The key is, is your immune system is normally is trained not to make antigens or antibodies against antigens it finds on your own cells. You don't want to make antibodies towards, say, an A antigen. You don't want to make an A antibody because that antibody will bind to your red blood cells and tell your immune system, hey, destroy this. This is foreign. Okay, so your immune system is trained not to make antibodies against your own antigens that it would find on cells in your body. Okay, so let's look at there are antibodies. All right, your body can make an anti A antibody that will attack A antigens, and anti B antibodies will attack B antigens. Okay. What we find with the ABO system, and this is going to differ from the RH system, okay, is you spontaneously make antibodies towards the antigens that your blood doesn't have. Okay, there is a similar. There must. There's a similar. The theory is is there's a similar antigen out there that is very similar to say the A antigen and there's another antigen out in the world that is similar to the B antigen and so it's said that you will make spontaneously make antibodies towards any antigen that your red blood cell doesn't have so in the case of say you have A antigen on your blood you have a blood type you will not make a antibody or anti a antibody okay because if you did your a antibodies would attack your own blood all right so if you don't have an antigen you're spontaneously making an antibody towards that antigen so looking here you can see all right and this is just for the abo system it's going to differ with the rh the rh we're going to actually have to see the antigen whereas here people that are a blood type they're not going to make anti-A antibodies because then the immune system would attack their own cells. But it's okay for them to make anti-B antibodies because there's none on here. There are no B antigens on the red blood cells, so those anti-B antibodies are not going to bind to the antigen. Okay, you can see these here. These Y, these are your antibodies. They are these Y-shaped proteins, and these little prongs would go bind the antigen. Okay? And an antigen B blood type. Antigen B, your blood has antigen B on it. You're not going to make B antibodies, but you'll make A. There's nothing for you. These will not bind to your red blood cells because you don't have a antibody on them. Now, AB, your immune system has been trained. You have both A and B antigen. Your immune system has been trained not to make either of these antibodies. 
And then the givers of the world are the O's. The O has neither A or B antigen. So they're okay. Their immune system can make A and B because there is no A or B antigen for those to bind to. All right, so that is the setup. Now you're gonna see why it's important that we match these blood types or who can transfuse to what. We're gonna see the givers in the world are the O blood types and the takers in the world are the AB blood type. <laughs> Professors in AB blood type, so I'm good in taking most any blood, but we'll see why here in just a second. Now for the second part of the blood type is that positive and negative we add. We have the AB system. Positive and negative has to do with uh, the RH system. Okay, and this is a little bit different um or it's also known as antigen d okay so if you have the antigen the rh antigen you're positive rh positive if you don't you're rh negative the difference between this and the abo system is that you will not spontaneously make these antibodies you have to see this antigen on a red blood cell that is positive to make the antibodies. So who's going to make, again, you're not going to make antibodies. Your immune system is trained not to make antibodies against your red blood cells. And so if you're positive, you don't have antibodies for it. It's the negative individuals, the ones with negative blood. But they don't make it spontaneously. They only make it when, if they see RH positive blood, then they will make these antibodies. Okay, so you just won't spontaneously find these antibodies. They have to have exposure. These negative individuals have to have exposure to this RH positive red blood cell. Okay, where might this take place? Blood transfusion, if you gave a person, uh, RH negative person, RH positive blood, of course they see the RH antigen and they'll start making antibodies. Okay, It takes a while for this to take place. It's not immediate. Okay? But where else might this come into play? Where else might we have some mixing of blood? classic example we use is what happens in pregnancy. In pregnancy, okay, there's no mixing of red blood cells from the placenta from mom to baby, but when delivery occurs, okay, there's blood everywhere, mom's blood, she's got open wounds, and baby's blood there. There's a possibility of baby's blood seeing mom's bloodstream. Some of those positive red blood cells getting into mom's bloodstream. If mom's RH positive, it doesn't matter. She's not going to make antibodies. But if mom is RH negative, then if she sees those red uh, the RH positive red blood cells from her baby gets in her bloodstream, then she has exposure to those RH positive red blood cells and mom will start making antibodies. For this baby that is born, it doesn't matter because mom has already delivered the baby. But now mom is producing RH antibodies. What happens when mom has a second pregnancy and that baby is rh positive all right so there's the subsequent pregnancies with rh positive remember the blood the blood cells the red blood cells don't cross the placenta but these antibodies the rh 
antibodies are small enough to cross across the placenta. And so in that case, if mom's producing the RH antibodies and the baby is RH positive, those antibodies can go across the placenta, get into baby's blood, and they cause what's called erythroblastosis pedialis. They're going to bind to baby's red blood cells and cause them to be destroyed. And there is a way to prevent this, and it is called Rogam. Right, so usually many times baby is not you have to do an amniocentesis to get a blood typing for a baby and that comes with risks of losing the baby and so forth so usually what happens is they will blood type mom and so which moms would need to get rogam what would their blood type be rh for the rh system why would we care yeah, any RH negative mom for a preventative measure, they would inject her with what's called Rogam. Okay, these are Rogam RH antibodies that will go against and trap any RH red blood cells that would be seen. And then ma it's as if mom never saw these RH positive red blood cells from. Uh, baby at birth, right? So any RH negative mom, right? As if they don't know the baby's blood type, as a preventative measure, they'll give her these Rogam shots. Usually, thirtieth week, and then right at um, delivery time, they'll give the Rogam shot to RH negative mom, and that will be as if their immune system. Even if blood from RH positive baby gets into mom's bloodstream, it's as if she's never seen those red blood cells. She's never seen that RH antigen. For an RH positive mom, again, it doesn't matter because an RH positive mom is not going to make RH antibodies, and so there won't be any problems with the birth, even if. The baby is RH positive. So let's look at medically, besides this pregnancy portion with the Rogam and RH positive, where does this come into play when we do blood transfusion, where we have to give a patient blood? Okay, we got to make sure we appropriately match the donor with the recipient. Okay, otherwise we can get a reaction called agglutination. And okay, because if we don't match it correctly, the antibodies in the recipient could go and attack the red blood cells from the donor blood. Okay, the donor blood cannot contain antigens in which the recipient has antibodies. Okay. Example, person with AB blood has B antibodies. What blood can't they see? They can't see any blood that the red blood cells have a B antigen in. So what does that have? That is B or AB because AB also has the B antigen because these antibodies will bind to those donor red blood cells and you can get this agglutination you can see the antibodies will bind to the red blood cells and clump them it will cause clumping of the red blood cells together and you can see we can get block of the vessels and this can be painful and dangerous in the same breath. So we've got to make sure we match up the blood types so we don't get this agglutination reaction. And here's kind of this cheat sheet 
on blood transfusions. Okay, remember the blood, the donor blood cannot have an antigen in which the person receiving the blood has an antibody for. So blood A has antibody B, so we can't see any blood type with B on it. So that leaves us with this person can receive A or O blood. Type B, they have the A antibodies in their blood, so they can't receive blood that has an A antigen. So we can't receive A and we can't receive AB, so that leaves us with B and O. Okay, here's the takers or the vampires of the world are AB. Their immune systems don't make either of the antibodies, so they can receive any blood type in the ABO system. Right? So your vampires gotta be AB blood or else they're gonna have a glutation. Now the givers in the world are the type O. Because the type O's don't have any antigens and therefore they make both antibodies. So they can't get any blood that has A antigen and they can't give get any blood that has a B antigen. So what's that leave them? All they can receive is O. So you can see here who are the givers. All the different ABO blood types can all receive O blood. So this is for the AB system, O is the universal donor blood. So if you have O blood, you have some gold running through your veins because your blood can be donated to anyone. The other caveat though is we have to add in the RH, the positive and negative factor. And so RH positive, can receive RH positive blood or RH negative blood because there are this person will not make RH antigen. RH negative person though can only receive RH negative blood. This goes back to that erythroblastus pedialis portion in that if mom is negative she can't we don't want her to see RH positive blood from baby. So if we put these two together, which blood type would not have any antigens on it? If we don't have any antigens on our red blood cells, none of these antibodies can bind to it. We don't have any issue. So the true universal donor space is O negative. Because we have no AB antigens on O negative and we have no RH antigen. So there is no antibodies that are going to bind to the red blood cells of O negative. So this is the gold standard of blood. If you're one of those individuals that have O negative blood and you find out, you'll be getting calls from the Red Cross all the time because this is the gold standard. If we have O negative, on our rigs, our ambulance rig, we can give O negative and not have to worry. You know, somebody's bleeding out. We're not going to have time. Hey, let's blood type you and see what blood we can give you. You give them O negative because you need to get that blood in right away. All right. So this is the gold standard or the universal donor of blood types. So now let's move on to um blood clotting and this is going to be taking place this is going to be those form elements of those platelets um, that we looked at briefly um, earlier on so the platelets are going to do they're going to promote what's called hemostasis in 
when we have a damaged vessel. So basically making our scabs. So when we break the endothelial lining, endothelial is the lining of the blood vessels, it's going to result in vasoconstriction. Okay, we're going to constrict the blood there because we don't want blood rushing out because if we dilate then we have blood just pouring out of this vessel okay so one of those factors is we're going to constrict the vessel and we're going to form the platelet plug so here's where our platelets come in we're forming that platelet plug to plug up where that break is in the in the filling lining all right and after we make that plug we're actually going to lay down this meshy like material this fiber and web that helps penetrate it surrounds the plug to give it more stability because we're going to be lining these vessels where blood is flowing through so we have to have this mesh like network to keep the plug otherwise the plug can basically get almost washed away All right so we're going to go through these steps in which we get this blood clotting to take place so we can heal these damaged vessels or this break in this endothelial lining. All right, so here's our platelets, and this is an, an intact blood vessel. Do we want a platelet plug forming in an intact vessel? No, because then we would clog these vessels. So we don't want the platelets glomming together or coagulating together in intact vessels. So what takes place to keep these platelets inactive so they're not binding together and forming a plug is the endothelial. When intact, it secretes prostaglandin I2, EGI2, and nitric oxide in the O here. This promotes vasodilation and sorry, prevents the aggregation of these platelets. Platelets, so they're not going to aggregate together and clump together. And we're going to have vasodilation of the vessel, so they'll be moving through nice and freely. What else is taking place is on the surface of these endothelial cells is the CD9 30 sorry CD39 and what is this this is an enzyme that breaks down ADP to AMP you see this reaction taking place right here ADP is released by activated platelets and promotes aggregation so we don't want ADP available because that will promote the aggregation of these platelets to form a plug. Again, we are in an intact vessel, so we don't want this taking place. So now let's look what happens to this process when we get damage to this endothelial lining, to these cells here. All right, when the vessel is broken, the platelets bind to the underlying collagen fibers that lie underneath the endothelial cells. Okay. When the platelets get stuck to collagen, we get what's called a platelet release reaction. And what takes place is the platelets are going to release ADP. Remember, ADP causes aggregation of vessels. And we get a molecule released called thromboxane A2. What do these factors do? They recruit more platelets to the site, right? and then they promote the aggregation or binding of the platelets together. So these platelets are inactivated. They're going to be activated and brought in to aggregate at the site where this break or damage is done in the filial lining. So it's almost like a positive reinforcement. 
these cause more platelets to come in and these platelets coming in get this release reaction increase more ADP more thromboxane with the new layer the new layer is going to release those and then we keep perpetrating or keep activating this platelet form this plug as we said the platelets I'm not going to worry about amplification or in vivo formation but what we see is basically what's going to happen is we lay down the platelets they get activated but that's not enough because we got blood rolling through here and this platelet plug is usually not strong enough to hold to not be washed away so what it also has to be done is we solidify it with this fibrin or this mesh knight like network to make a nice firm platelet and keep it intact Right, so that's there. Now what happens when the vessel fills over? We need to go almost in the reverse direction in that we have to get rid of this plug. Right. And so as the blood vessel along, we activate these factors and basically we're going in reverse direction in which we get degradation of the fibrin and degradation of the plug. The molecule is plasma will help digest that fibrin, that mesh network that is helping keeping that plug together. All right, so when we get a break, we get those activated platelets to make a plug, and then they get solidified with that fibrin mesh network. And then after we walls have healed, we get these factors get released, making plasma that is going to basically break down that fibrin polymer, and now our platelet plug basically be graded and washed away. All right, so we've seen the blood, and so that's going to be our medium, which carries these nutrients, carries these respiratory gases, hormones, and all this other stuff in the blood. Let's look at how we get the blood out to the tissues, our system and our cardiovascular system, and that's basically its function, is to get pump the blood out to the tissues, to feed in nutrients, to feed in oxygen, and then to pick up that waste. Um, so cardiovascular system, we're going to have what's going to create the force in which we are able to push blood out through the body and up to the lungs is that heart. And then we have the vasculature, the blood vessels are going to carry, all right, our arteries carry blood away from the heart towards the tissue, all right, so the left ventricle is going to be pumping the blood into the aorta and then out to the tissue. Where we actually get exchange, we get, say, oxygen to the tissue, we pick up carbon dioxide from the tissue and bring it into the bloodstream, is where we get the exchange for all these materials is at the capillaries. So we're looking here for the arteries feed in to the capillaries, we get exchange, and then we return the blood to the heart via the venous system, via the veins. And so we'll get in. First, we're going to focus on the heart. We'll look at the anatomy and we'll look at its functioning and how it operates, how it creates this pumping action, and basically look at what we call the cardiac cycle, the movement of blood through the heart. And then we'll end the lecture with looking at the vasculature, looking at the arteries, capillaries, and veins, and breaking them down into their smaller components.
So when we look at the heart, we got a four chamber structure and we have the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle and left ventricle. And the flow is gonna be blood is returned from the body to the right atrium of the heart, right atrium pumps to the right ventricle and the right ventricle up to the lungs. You can see this blood is all blue. It's that denotes it as deoxygenated. It's not void of oxygen, but it has less oxygen than the red blood that will be leaving the heart. Because what do we do? The right ventricle's job is to pump to the lungs. We get oxygenated. This is where we pick up the oxygen, and that oxygenated blood returns to the left ventricle, or sorry, to the left atrium, left atrium into the left ventricle, and then the left ventricle out into the aorta and to the rest of the system. So we have, we can divide the circulation into two parts. We have pulmonary circulation, and that involves this portion, the left ventricle, up to the lungs and then back to the aorta. So you can think right side of the heart being the pulmonary circulation, okay? Because it's involved in bringing and getting pulmonary, pulmonary being lungs, getting the blood to the lungs and then back to the heart. The rest, so the left atrium all the way to the aorta, back to the right atrium, is considered our systemic all right, so carries blood from the left side of the heart, left ventricle, to the right side, back to the right atrium. So this is going out to all the body. So you can see it contains all this vasculature that is supplying the blood to all the tissue throughout the body. Okay, so the systemic circulation is much longer, much more vessels compared to that of the pulmonary circulation okay we leave through the aorta go through those ascending branches that go to the arms heads and brain the abdominal aorta brings it down and starts sending the blood out to the various tissues all right so we go arteries to capillaries and then the blood comes back to the venous side and we're going to return it back to the right atrium all right so that is the flow through that systemic circulation as you can see there is much more vasculature to the systemic than there is to that of the pulmonary. When we return, we get the superior and inferior vena cava back to the right atrium. And then we get to the right ventricle and we're back into the pulmonary circulation. But what we're going to see is that pulmonary circulation, even though it is smaller in length, there's not much blood, those parts, the blood leaving the uh, right side has to match that leaving the left side. So they have to be matched, otherwise blood would get pulled up in one of those chambers. All right, so systemic circulation, one important, one of the beginning portions, the first branch coming off of the aorta is a coronary circulation. So the heart is going to get and supply its own blood first. So we have these branches, coronary arteries, going off, branching off to supply the blood to the heart. Just part of the, again, we've left the left ventricle, so we're in the systemic, but coronary circulation, part of that systemic circulation. So for the heart, we'll spend a little more time. Uh, we'll go over a little anatomy uh, lessons. Um, so if you forget your heart anatomy, um, you might want to go back and take a look um, because we'll be discussing a lot of these structures in the functioning and how the heart pumps and through the cardiac cycle, um, like what valves are shutting and so forth. So we'll go through, we'll look at the heart anatomy, and then we'll get into nuts and bolts on how it functions, how we get contractions, and how we move the blood around the heart um, before we move on to blood vessels. All right, so here uh, our heart is encased in that pericardium. If you remember, it's a serous membrane, so it has two layers to it, a visceral that's going to be basically attached right on the outside of the heart, 
basically surrounding it. And then the parietal layer, that's the outer layer. And inside there's that serous fluid and the heart's bouncing around. So we don't want to have friction. This allows it to move. The pericardium also keeps it from expanding too far. We don't want the heart to get too expansive. And so prevents this, okay, reduces the friction with the lubrication and also creates it from um, expansion too far. Okay, so that's the pericardium. The one around here. Now well, let me get my little look in here again. Two, you can see here, that was two. That's the visceral layer. It's basically surrounding the whole outside of the heart and the parietal layer with the fluid inside to allow us that reduction in friction. So we already discussed the four chambers. We got the two atriums and we got the two ventricle and the heart's divided basically by the septum that runs, divides the heart from left and right halves. And the atrium is going to be receiving blood. The right atrium is receiving blood from the rest of the body. The left atrium is receiving the blood back from the pulmonary circulation. And the atriums are going to pump blood into ventricles. And the, vent the ventricles are going to pump out to the arteries, the large arteries, in this case, the pulmonary artery. And this one, the aorta. So you can think of each half functioning as an independent pump. Remember the right side involved in the pulmonary circulation and the left side involved in that systemic circulation. There's that septum dividing the halves there. Okay, and then we'll get into each of these individual structures and we'll start looking at the valves because this is going to be important in pumping of the blood through the heart and keeping what we call backflow. We want the blood pumping in one direction. So to prevent the backflow, we're going to have these valves in place. So the actual physical pumping of the blood, we're going to look at the electrical activity like we did in lab. Um, but for the actual physical pumping of the blood, there are basically six main structure, actually eight main structures for us to know. We need to know the different chambers, the left atrium, right atrium, left ventricle, left, or sorry, right ventricle, left ventricle. And then the valves, the valves, we're going to have two different sets of valves and we first have the AV valves, the atrial ventricular valves. We have a right and a left and that essentially tells you from your anatomy days if you remember they are between the atrium and the ventricles. And then the semilunar valves, we have the pulmonary semilunar and the aortic semilunar and those are going to be between the ventricles and the two big arteries in which the right ventricle pumps out to and the left ventricle into the aorta. So let's look a little closer into these valves and basically their functions. We got the AV and the semilunar valves and basically these valves are going to function so the blood pumps in one direction. It would be very inefficient for us to contract the ventricle and blood flows back into the atrium because we want the blood going out into those large arteries, either the pulmonary artery or into the aorta, depending on whether we're at the right or left ventricle. Okay, we have, we already discussed, we have the two sets of AV valves and the semilunar valves. In our AV valves, we have those chordae tendineae and papillary muscles. These help prevent the valves from doing what we call prolapse.
collapsing in, letting blood flow back. But let's first take a look at the AV valves and their function and basically kind of what's going to cause them to close. Okay, again, those AV valves are between the atrium and the ventricle. And remember, the blood flow is we want the blood to flow from the atrium to the ventricles and then from the ventricles out into those big arteries. Okay, so once we get the blood into the ventricles, we don't want it flowing backwards into the atrium when the ventricles are contracting and creating that pressure. Okay, tricuspid, bicuspid, I will use AV valve, so I will use right AV valve and for the tricuspid and left AV valve for the bicuspid. But basically there are these flaps. There's these flaps and what's gonna happen is when blood is pushed, when the ventricles contract, what's gonna happen? The pressure is going to increase and that's gonna push blood and blood's gonna wanna flow back to the atrium. But these clasps, when the blood pushes against them, boom, snaps shut. Okay, so that's what's happening with the AV valves. When the ventricles are contracting, blood being pushed against those valves are going to snap them shut, snap those clasps shut. And if you remember, we have those chordae, tendinae, and the papillary muscles, they're not involved in shutting the valves it is the pressure from the blood pushing against them that shuts them but those papillary and chordae tendinae um, structure are there to prevent valves from prolapsing we want them to stay shut right again when the ventricles contract the blood gets pushed against those valves snapping them shut and then preventing the blood from moving backwards into the atrium. Now the other set of valves, those are the semilunars. We have the pulmonary and semilunar and aortic semilunar. And these are basically going to be sitting in between the ventricles and the major arteries in which each ventricle pumps out to, pumps the blood out to. In the case for the left ventricle, we're gonna be the aorta, so the aortic semilunar, and for the right ventricle, that's going to pump out to the pulmonary trunk or pulmonary artery. That's the pulmonary semilunar. Okay. They are three cup like leaves, okay. preventing the backflow from the arteries because when you take your blood pressure, it's not zero. There is still pressure in there, so blood's going to want to flow backwards into. The ventricles, when they are relaxing, the pressure is getting low in the ventricles, blood wants to go backwards into the ventricles. We don't want that. We want to keep going out into the arteries further out. All right, and so that's the function of the semilunar valves, is to prevent the backflow into the ventricle. That's taking place when ventricles are relaxing, blood's trying to rush back, and those valves will snap shut, prevent that backflow. So on these, we don't need that connective tissue. We don't need that chordae tendinase. Pressure is not as great as when the ventricles are creating this pressure. All right, so our heart valves, they are snapping shut when pressure is going against them. When the ventricles are contracting, the AVs are snapping shut. When the ventricles are relaxing, the semilunars are snapping shut. And so from a medical standpoint, you can think this is actually what your doctor's listening to when he's listening to your heart. He's listening to your heartbeat. And what's making the sounds, there's basically two sounds to the heartbeat. There's a lub and a dub. The lub is the AV valve snapping shut. And the dub, the second sound, is the semilunars snapping shut. So we get one, two, one, two. It's the two sets of valves set snapping shut. Okay, so for the first heart sound, the lub, 
That's the AV valves. So when the ventricles are contracting and the sounds are from the turbulence in the blood. When we snap shut, the blood is being turbulent. And so that is what's giving us those sounds. And when the semilinear valves snap shut, and then so when the semilunar valves snap shut, we get the second heart sound. Again, it's the turbulence of the blood that we're hearing. Those valves are snapping shut. All right, we'll end the little anatomy lesson, at least for the physical part of the heart, not the electrical system, but for the physical part. We'll end it with this fibrous skeleton here. There's this tissues, four fibrous tissues, and basically serves multiple functions. It's going to be, as we're talking, our heart chambers, our muscles, and so we have to have an insertion and an origin, and that is what where we're attaching is at this fibrous skeleton. See the fibers of the cardiac muscle coming here and attaching. So it forms an origin insertion. What also is in this fibrous skeleton? And where we're looking at is basically we're looking essentially almost down on the heart. We've sliced away the atrium. So this fibrous skeleton is sitting between the atrium and then down below is the ventricle. Okay, so the atriums would be coming up over in this portion here. It would be looping up, it would be in above here or superior using our anatomical terms. Okay. Besides origin insertion, they also house the four heart valves. And then finally, they also act or it also acts as a electrical insulator. Right? It insulates the atriums from the ventricles. We'll see why when we get into the electrical system, why we need this insulator in between here, between the atrium and the ventricles. Right? This allows us to not be connected electrically between those two structures, between the atrium and the ventricles. Because we're going to have to go through a specialized conduction, specialized region to get from the atrium to the ventricles electrically. All right, so this is the end of part one. Now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the functioning. We're going to look into the electrical activity through the heart. Because remember, this heart is a muscle, and so we need to get an action potential. So we'll look at the action potentials or the electrical activity of the heart, and then we'll get into the actual physical pumping when we look at the cardiac cycle. Okay. And then at the end, for part two, we'll end it with the blood vessels. So part two, again, looking at the electrical activity, looking at the cardiac cycle of the heart, and then we'll finish up with the blood vessels.